for um, for uh, since uh, late 2015. Uh, I have been a bear biologist for almost 35 years now. I started with uh, studying black bears, mostly in New York and New Mexico. And then I've been working on grizzly bear work for about the last 10 years or so. Um, and today I wanna give you some background on some grizzly bear research that we've been doing recently uh, myself colleagues in the uh, Yellowstone ecosystem. And then there's a few other studies that are fellow biologists in other areas that I wanna talk about as well. Um, but we're really kind of honing in on some of the kind of neat aspects of grizzly bear nutritional ecology. And I think it will help people think about how to deal with um, bears getting into human foods and maybe ways to avoid it. So uh, before I start, I, I want to just kind of go through some of the different topics that I'm going to talk about. Um, and I, I'll try to remember to kind of pause at the end of each of these sections so people can ask questions if they have them. Um, but I want to start first with a little bit of background biology on bears. Um, and then I want to talk about what do bears eat, uh, what determines what they eat at a given time, um, do bears get the energy that they need from the food that they're feeding on? And then why are human foods attractive to bears? And then what can we do about it? So those are kind of the where I'm going to go from here. The talk is mostly going to be about grizzly bears, but there's going to be some information on black bears as well. And like I mentioned, a lot of it is based on research that's coming from the Yellowstone ecosystem, but it's very much applicable to additional areas. So just to get as a little bit of background, um, bears are members of the order Carnivora. This is um, an order that also includes the families of the dogs, the cats, the seals, hyenas, weasels, mongooses, and raccoons. So um, it, is a, it is an order that is characterized by animals that are primarily carnivorous. Um, and most of the carnivores have a simple, short digestive tract that is specifically evolved to consume and assimilate protein. Um, but bears have kind of diverged from that in terms of having more of an omnivorous diet, but they still have that simple, short digestive tract of a carnivore, which allows them to readily consume and assimilate protein, but they're not as good at um, deriving some of the um, nutrition that is present in some of the plant foods because they don't have, for example, the, the digestive tract of an ungulate that can use the bacteria in their gut to um, get more out of the plant foods that they feed on. Um, I wanna talk about the kind of the annual cycle of how bears live. And when we're talking about how, how bears feed, um, you can't ignore hibernation. Uh, bears are spending as much as six months of the year inside a den. And so when you think about that, that means that they're having to acquire the energy for a whole year in the six months or eight months that they're active and out there feeding. Um, in Montana, we typically are seeing bears um, denning sometime between October and December, probably with a peak of most bears going into the den sometime during the month of November. Um, they might come out as early as late January or February. We sometimes see males coming out of the den and, real, and looking for winter kill and that kind of thing. Um, but most of the time bears are coming out between March and May probably with a peak in late March or early April. Um, during the months of May, June, July, and August, we can kind of consider those normal feeding activity months when they're engaged in a lot of different activities and also feeding. Um, but during September, October, and then into November, and until they go into the den, they're in this period that we call hyperphagia, 
where they're really spending almost all of their time trying to acquire foods and fatten up for the denning period. This is kind of interesting because the mating season is early, in, it, it, it occurs in the spring, probably with a peak around June. Um, and so that's that time when they're in their normal feeding activity. Um, and it's separate from the time when they're in hyperphagia. The interesting thing about it is, is that the bears undergo this process called delayed implantation, where after the mating season happens, if they when they have a fertilized egg, it just stays in this um, kind of uh, dormant state and floats around in the fallopian, fallopian tubes of the female until um, sometime in the late fall or early winter, and then it implants into the, the wall of the uterus and the gestation begins. So this delayed implantation basically allows them to have a mating season that is separate from that period when they're trying to fatten up before they go into the den. And then the, the gestation starts sometime in, usually in December, and then they give birth um, sometime in January or February in this area. Um, and the females give birth in the den. And if so, of course, that's also tied into their feeding ecology because a female that is giving birth not only had to put on enough weight to get her through the winter, but she also has to gestate and then lactate her new litter in the den. And so that's a really big um, energetic cost that she has to basically um, get all the energy for before she goes into the den. And so uh, the cubs are born in the den, they're awake, they're not hibernating um, as cubs of the year, they're just um, in the den and they're nursing with the mom um, and then they all come out of the den. And uh, in black bears, the, the cubs will stay with their mother for an additional year and they will den with her during their second year. At that point, they will also hibernate. Um, and with grizzly bears, it is typical for them to stay with their mother for two additional winters where they den with her. We do have some cases where um, grizzly bears will become independent of their mother as a year length. Um, large body size is advantageous for bears. So of course, feeding is important for that as well. So larger females have more resources for um, their reproduction. Larger males um, uh, will enjoy be better mating success because they can outcompete out smaller males for mating in um, kind of the competition for mates. Um, but there are some drawbacks to having a large body size because it requires more da daily energy input. And I'll talk about that in terms of some of the studies a little bit later. Um, another thing to be, to kind of keep in mind in this presentation is that bears have a slow life history strategy. So they have a long lifespan. We have bears that have, uh, live well into their 20s, um, their mid-20s. We've even had a few individuals that we know lived past the age of 30 in the wild. Um, they uh, typically do not have their first reproduction until they're um, at least four. Um, they may be, males may be reproductively mature at a younger age, but they, because they have to compete with older males and bigger males, they usually don't really um, have their first offspring until a much older age. And then females, uh, the youngest age that we know of is four, for their first litter and sometimes they wait until the ages of six or seven before they have their first litter. They have small litter sizes and then there's that extended period of prolonged female care and so their interval between litters is probably pretty long. But be because of this long slow life history strategy, um, when bears are thinking about how to use the energy that they um, got from the food that they're feeding on, they can make both long-term and short-term choices. Choices, I say. Um, they're obviously instinctual choices and not um, cognitive ones, but they can make different choices about the use of that energy. 
Um, I did want to just mention really quickly, I just, I'm probably going to mention different study areas or in different populations. So I just wanted to provide this map for people that might not be too familiar about where we have bears in Montana or in the lower 48 states, but we have bears in four occupied recovery areas. Those are the Selkirks, the Cabinet Yak, the Northern Continental Divide, which we refer to as the NCDE, and the Yellowstone Ecosystem, which we sometimes call the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem or the GYE. We actually have two other recovery areas that were identified in the recovery plan, one in Washington in the North Cascades and one that's mostly in Idaho in the Bitterroot Ecosystem. At the time that bears were listed in 1975, either there were a few remnant bears in the North Cascades, um, there were, or we thought that there was potentially still a remnant population in the Bitterroot ecosystem, but both of them are unoccupied at this time. So this gets us to the first kind of question, um, and I can stop if we have any questions at this point. Question. Okay. Yeah, so let me pull it up. So uh, Pam asked, I have read that their bodies somehow know if they have enough body fat percentage to sustain her and her cubs. If not, she miscarries the fertilized egg. How, do we know how their bodies know that fat percentage? That's a really good question. So um, what we do know about it is that um, bears that are less than in, in a captive study, we know that there seems to be a little bit of a cutoff where, where if bears have less than 20% body fat, they typically do not end up having a litter that we observe. We don't actually know all the myriad ways that they might lose that litter. Um, it might be that they reabsorb the fetuses. It may be that they um, give birth, but the the, cut, the litter doesn't survive. Um, and they may lose their litter in the wild when we're seeing bears. We don't really see them until they come out of the den. So they may have had a litter that lived for a short time but died by the time we saw it. So there's a, a few different ways where that lack of resources may cause the litter to be lost. Um, a lot of people think that um, the implantation is tied to whether or not they have the fat stores. And that might be true, but we actually don't have the evidence to say that that is actually what we know is happening. Okay. So next little section, we're gonna talk about what bears eat. And this is focused on a Yellowstone study that was uh, the leader of that study was Kerry Gunther. He's a biologist with Yellowstone National Park. And what the study did is they looked at all the records that they had of grizzly bear feeding activity or scat analysis or anything else that talked about what bears ate going all the way back to, I believe the 1880s. And so they gathered it all up. And with that study, they were able to identify 266 different food items that we know grizzly bears feed on just in the Yellowstone ecosystem. Um, the vast majority of those, 175 of them, were plant foods. And I'm gonna talk about the different types of plant foods that bears feed on first. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about whether or not they're high in protein or carbohydrates. And that will be, the reason I'm talking about that will become apparent in a little while. Um, so one of the main foods that they feed on is something I kind of refer to as above ground vegetation. This brings in green grasses, um, you know, they're eating leaves, they're eating stems. Sometimes they eat the flowers of vegetation. So there's a lot of different types of foods that they're feeding on, but we're calling them all above ground vegetation. Um, bears spend, I would think, a little bit of time almost every single day grazing on those types of foods and sometimes spending a lot of time feeding on them. They tend to be very high in protein, but they're, they're not very calorie dense. So they don't have a lot of calories in them because a lot of what's in the plant is not digestible to bears. Um, but they are high in protein, and so the bears can extract the protein from these foods. 
Um, another type of food is below ground vegetation. So this is eating either roots or forms or bulbs that kind of grow underground. Um, there's a, a variety of these types of plants that bears feed on um, and they can come up seasonally at different times being really important. Not only will they dig up, dig up individual plants, but they will also dig up the caches of some of the rodents. Rodents will go around and collect these and make a little cache that's underground and the bears can smell those. They will dig those up as well. Um, and this digging activity, which is a little bit, um, well, actually it's far more common in grizzly bears than it is in black bears is probably the explanation for why they have those very long claws. Some people look at those claws and they may think that they're mostly a weapon for taking uh, for predation, but they're, that's really not their main use. Um, their main use is really as a digging tool. Um, the next kind of group of foods, plant foods that bears will focus in on are fruit, fleshy fruit, um, which we often call soft mast. Um, in the Yellowstone ecosystem, there is a kind of a limited amount of these um, soft fruit. Um, it's somewhat dry in a lot of the ecosystem. And so um, you find the, the fleshy fruit in more moist areas, but where they do find it, the bears are definitely going to go look for it. Um, up in the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem and in the Selkirks and the Cabinet Yaks, um, huckleberries are one of the main um, soft, uh, soft mass species that bears will feed on. Um, the other kind of mast that bears will feed on, which we call hard mast, there's only really one species that we have available in this area, and that's the seeds of the white bark pine. Um, and so uh, those are really valuable to bears because they have they're really high in fats. Um, and I forgot to mention that both the fruit and the below ground vegetation tend to be really high in carbohydrates. The fruit, it's mostly sugar. In the uh, below ground vegetation, it's kind of a starchy sort of carbohydrate. Um, and then finally, the last plant food that I wanted to talk about is cambium. And this is where bears will actually take their claws, they'll scratch the bark off of trees, and then they'll lick up and kind of suck up the uh, the cambium layer that's underneath that is the, these are the vessels that actually bring the sugars up and down the tree through photosynthesis. And so that's also a food that's very high in carbohydrates. It's a little more commonly seen um, as a food for black bears than grizzly bears, but they both, both species will feed on those. Um, the next group of foods, um, the next most common one was vertebrates. And so we're talking about bears feeding on some sort of meat. Um, and this can range from smaller animals like a pocket gopher or a cutthroat trout all the way up to the size of bison. Um, bears will uh, get meat in a number of different ways. Um, they are predators and they are capable of taking down um, a large variety of sizes of, of um, prey. Um, but there are certain seasons that they're um, focusing in on those, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, they're also getting a lot of meat resources through scavenging. Um, that's looking for winter kill, that's looking for bear, for um, animals that die maybe because of the rutting um, behavior and that kind of thing. Bears have very excellent noses, and so they're going to go, they can smell um, uh, a carcass from a long distance, and then they will go find it. Uh, bears also engage what, in what we call kleptoparasitism, which is essentially food stealing. So in an in a ecosystem like Yellowstone, where we have a variety of different types of predators, bears um, are often engaged in stealing the carcasses from other predators like, um, like mountain lions and wolves and black bears. They will take them. And for the most part, grizzly bears tend to be at the high end of that hierarchy. They can usually take things from a lot of the other species except maybe a pretty large pack of, um, of wolves. Um, and then they will opportunistically just um, eat other 
um, vertebrates when they can. An, ex an example of this is I talked about how they might spend time digging up the little caches of um, roots that, for example, a pocket gopher might might um, collect. As they're digging for the caches of the pocket gopher, I suspect sometimes they actually catch a pocket gopher too. And maybe that wasn't their original reason for doing it, but it was just kind of a bonus meal. And then the third big group of uh, foods that bears will feed on are insects. And um, a couple of the common ones that we see are digging up for ants. With the ants, they're gonna eat both the, the actual adults and they're also gonna try to eat up the pupae um, of the ants. This is a food that bears will feed on really frequently, but in very short bouts. So if you can imagine, and you may have seen um, logs like this that have been dug through by a bear. A bear's going to dig in and uh, kind of slurp up the as many of the ants as possible before they all disappear. But as you can imagine, they kind of disappear pretty fast. So it's, it's the kind of food that they feed on frequently, but in short bouts, and they probably don't get a lot at each individual feeding. Um, one of the insects that they do get a little bit more frequently and they can spend a little bit more time feeding on is these uh, army cutworm moths. And army cutworm moths are a species that actually live out in the Great Plains. Um, and then they, they migrate up to the very high, um, highest areas um, on the Eastern sides of the Rocky Mountains. And they go up and they, they feed on the alpine vegetation at night um, mostly the flowers, they'll feed on the nectar flowers um, at night. And then during the day, they will um, essentially hide in the crevices of these talus slopes of these high elevations. And the bears basically just spend the day digging them out. Um, again, I'm sure that each time they dig them out, they're just getting a little bit, but the, the slope, talus slopes are so filled with moths that they can spend all day kind of feeding on them. Insects are very high in protein and fats, and so they're really valuable foods for bears um, that we sometimes don't really think about as much as we should. So I'll stop there and see if there's more questions. Yes, there is another question. Andy is asking, when grizzlies have made their way into other mountain ranges of Montana and areas like Fort Benton, you're saying, there's still not populations at all in the two areas you mentioned in Idaho and Washington. Is there no population or just not a recovered population? So as I do have a, a map that I will show a little later in the presentation that kind of shows how bears have expanded into other areas. Um, at this point, where they're expanding into these kind of new areas where they haven't been for a very long time, we're still kind of considering them part of these four populations. They've just expanded beyond the boundaries where we kind of expected perhaps. Um, and they are using different habitats than maybe they their predecessors did, um, but we still consider them part of the, the original population. Um, if we get bears that move all the way into the Bitterroot ecosystem um, and then start kind of setting up a population there, we will probably identify that as a separate population at some point. So with all this diversity in terms of the different foods that they eat, um, what determines what they eat at any given time? So the first thing that we have to think about is seasonality. Um, obviously, not all these foods are available all the time. Um, so if you look at uh, the springtime, their, some, of the, some of their choices are pretty, are pretty limited. Um, when they come out of the den, they're gonna be feeding on mostly green vegetation. Um, they'll look for winter kill. Um, a little bit later in the spring, they'll start looking for the neonates as those are being born. Um, elk calves, deer fawn, um, bison calves potentially. Um, and then they'll start looking at um, feeding on ants, um, the cambium. And then midsummer, those are important foods, but then they'll start looking for the berries and the roots and the fungi. 
and the moths if that's where they live. Um, for the few bears that have access to fish, those, those are usually a summer food. And then in the fall, they'll be really concentrating on berries and pine nuts and then ungulates in the fall. Um, if they have access to them, sometimes, like I mentioned, the males that are involved in rutting activity can be weakened and a little bit easier to prey on. Um, bears will also pay, um, uh, take advantage of the fact that we have a lot of hunters out there in the field and they will focus in on eating gut piles left from hunter kills. Another part of it is geography. So there was a scientist named Stephen Mealy that studied uh, bear biology back in the 1980s, mostly in Yellowstone National Park. And he defined this thing we call feeding economies and he identified three of them within Yellowstone. So the idea here is that different bears living in different areas are gonna have ac access to different foods. And so each area is gonna have a different feeding economy. So one of them that he identified was the Valley Plateau economy. This is really focused around the ungulates that are available in places like the Hayden Valley or the Pelican Valley, if you've been to the park, um, really not high numbers of ungulates. Then it would also be, of course, supplemented with all kinds of plant foods, um, roots and those sort of things. Um, he identified the the lake economy, which would be bears that are living around Yellowstone Lake and are able to um, feed on the spawning cutthroat trout, obviously a very limited um, uh, or geographically limited um, food economy. And then the mountain economy one was that where he identified that bears were really focusing a lot of their attention um, on white bark pine seeds. And you can see in this map that the white bark pine is that darker area um, all around kind of the, the eastern edge and the northern edge of Yellowstone Park. Um, since that time, we've, um, we've kind of identified a new feeding economy that, we, that he had not identified, which I would just call the alpine economy where bears are spending a lot of time on those army cutworm moths. Um, we see a very similar thing. This is a map from the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem, and Justin Tysberg, who works for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, has been taking a bunch of our hair samples and blood samples when we capture bears in the NCDD. And with those, you can do this thing called stable isotope analysis, which actually allows you to look at the relative proportion of animal matter in the diet of bears. And this is a little bit of a heat map that shows just how much animal matter is in the diet. This, is, this includes both meat and insects. Um, and so you can see that in the Northwest part of the ecosystem, it's a pretty low amount of animal food in the diet. We would call that the mountain economy. This is also the more moist and um, kind of green area of the ecosystem and it is where we typically see the most huckleberries. And so the bears in that area, I would define as living in a mountain economy with huckleberries as a primary food. And then the bears to the south and the east of there are kind of a valley economy at the edge of the prairie and um, ungulates seem to be very important for those bears. Another factor that we have to think about when we think about how bears decide to eat what they do is that bears really favor foods where the energy content, what they're getting from the food, far, far exceeds the energy that they expend to get it. Now, most animals are gonna kind of forage the same way, but again, because of this hibernation thing, bears really have to think about that, um, so to speak. Um, we find that the average body size is higher in populations with more calorie dense food um, that's easily obtainable. And one of those is meat. And if you think about the size of bears that are feeding up there on the salmon streams in Alaska, those are enormous bears. And that's because they have this very predictable food that comes in, you know, most years it's pretty easy for them to catch and it's really calorie dense. And so they are able to attain these really large body sizes based on that. 
Um, there's been some study. I have this picture here. Um, this is from the Washington State Bear Center. It's a, a lab run by Charlie Robbins, and he has students that study there with him. And they've been looking at the nutritional ecology of captive bears for many years. And one of the things they found was that large bears in the range of 220 to 265 pounds have um, difficulty gaining weight if they only feed on things like vegetation or berries. And that's um, one of the reasons that they looked into this is because they found that, well, actually, let me go on. So one of the reasons that they see this is it's because a large bear has much more of a daily requirement of energy just to maintain that large body. They, you know, they have more cells in their body. They have to use more energy to keep that body going. Um, and when you think about um, how the intake rate of big bears versus little bears, when they're feeding on things like vegetation, when they're just grazing or when they're having to use their little mouth and their tongue to glean berries off of bushes, there's not a huge difference between big bears and small bears, but the big bears are not, are, they're just not intaking enough to cover all of their, the costs of their large body size. And so it almost suggests that if a bear is a vegetarian, there's kind of an upper limit in terms of how big that bear can get and roughly in the, in the range of 250 pounds, with some exceptions. Another example of this foraging efficiency, which is really important in the Yellowstone ecosystem and in, in the NCBD to a certain degree as well, um, this relates to the whitebark pine. And whitebark pine is an interesting plant because the, the, you know, the, the seeds come in cones, they are a pine nut, um, but the cones don't fall off the trees naturally. They actually stay on the tree for quite a long time. And so the way that, and because bears are uh, grizzly bears are not very good at climbing trees, they typically are not climbing trees to try, to try to get at this food. And they're trying to get this food in, in bulk instead of getting individual um, cones. And so what they rely on is the a poor little red squirrel who spends its whole fall trying to gather up these uh, cones and make what they see, what they call a cache or a, or a squirrel midden. And the bears basically just come along and uh, feed on the food once the squirrel has made it a dense little um, package of food for them. And I'm sure that the poor squirrels are not thrilled by this, but I'm sure that there's a few remnants left for the squirrels to feed on. Um, and then one other aspect of it that's that we've just learned about, and this is uh, kind of the exciting part of their feeding ecology, is that same Washington State Bear Center they basically wanted to look at how bears mixed different foods in their diet. And one of the reasons that they undertook this study is that they noticed there were students that had done some work up in Alaska where they were watching bears feeding on salmon streams. And they noticed that sometimes the bears would actually feed this, leave the salmon stream where there's almost an unlimited number of fish for them to feed on. And they would go up into the up into the hills and they would start feeding on berries. And they were questioning why would they do that? So they did some, some um, simulation study or some uh, trials, feeding trials, where they would put a bear in the room and they would give it access to three different kinds of foods. One that's, one that's fat, basically. They would just give it pure pieces of, of um, animal fat. They would give it apples, which are really high in carbohydrates, and they would give it meat, which are which is really high in protein. And then they would look at what they chose, and then they would look at how how their um, how much weight they would gain um, depending on how they made these choices. And the optimal diet where they gained the most weight was seventeen percent protein, and most of the bears focused their attention around that within a few days of understanding what was available to them, within three days on average, they would start feeding an optimal, on an optimal diet where they were balancing out 
these macronutrients um, so that they were getting 17% in their diet, 17% protein in their diet. And so um, we had a question in the Yellowstone ecosystem, can they do this in the wild? And the way that we were able to even look at this is that in the 2000s, um, there was a study in Grand Teton National Park where they were trying to look at the, the differences in the ecology of black bears and grizzly bears. Um, and this is, this is before there were a lot of bears in the southern, uh, grizzly bears in the southern part of the park so that they were actually able to look at grizzly bears. They were able to look at black bears that lived you know, in the same area as the grizzly bears, St. Patrick black bears. And then they were also able to look at allopatric black bears, which basically lived in the absence of grizzly bears. And so they had a nice sample of all these different bears. Um, and what they would do, these were um, GPS collared bears. And so they would take the locations from these GPS collared bears for a 24 hour period. And they would just randomly select a day and a bear and they would go to all of their locations for all of their GPS locations for that 24 hour period. They would, they would note any kind of feeding activity um, that they saw in the area of the location and then they would collect any scat. And from that, we were able to identify all of the different foods that a bear fed on for that day. Um, and then we would look at the nutritional um, uh, content of the different types of foods. And so we were able to look at the proportion of the energy that came from different food types and the proportion of energy that came from protein, uh, carbohydrates, or lipids, or fats, fats or lipids. So once we had this kind of sample of a bunch of different days for a bunch of different bears, um, we did what we do call cluster analysis, and that kind of identified similar diets for different days. Um, and we identified 14 different daily diet types for um, taking all of the bears together. Um, and in this graph, you will see a little dotted line that's at 17%. That's the 17% uh, protein that would be the ideal a mixture of carbohydrate and protein and lipid. Um, and then we wanted to see how many of them were close to this optimum. So as you can see, most of the daily diets were um, really high in protein. They were well above that, um, that level. There were a couple that were below the level. Um, and I, I might go back for a second. Um, and then there were a couple that were um, really close to that um, optimal. One of them that's interesting when you're really close to the optimal is the white bark pine. So white bark pine in and of itself is almost a perfect food for grizzly bears or black bears. Um, and if they could spend all their time feeding on it, they would do really, really well. I am going to back up for just one minute because I forgot to mention one thing about that study um, that they at the Washington Bear Center. I wanted to uh, draw your attention to the little graph on the left where you look at the rate of gain. And so if the protein content is below the optimum, there's a really sharp decline in their weight gain um, because they're have because they're not basically just not getting enough protein in their diet at all. Um, and they have to, to make up for it in other ways. If they eat more protein um, than the optimal, there's a much gentler decline in their rate of gain. So when you look at some of these diets where they were overeating, um, they were essentially over consuming protein, a lot of them are also just really calorie dense food. So the very highest one you can see is the vertebrates. So this is times when they're feeding on meat, they're definitely overeating protein, but they're getting whole, whole lot of calories. And so they're not really probably losing much in terms of value in that respect. Um, some of the optimal diets though, were seasonally limited and they typically came in much smaller packages than 
uh, what do you see with vertebrates? So in that way, they're not getting as many calories um, as they would with some of the, the meat. This is a graph where uh, I'm showing the spring, summer, and fall diets of the grizzly bears, the sympatric black bears, and the allopatric black bears, um, both females and males. So it's, it's kind of a busy, busy graph. Um, but one of the things I'll draw your attention to is that about half of the energy for both species came from animal foods, but for grizzly bears, most of it was in the form of vertebrates, and for black bears, most of it was in the form of insects. Um, you will also see that um, the fruit or vegetation only diets tended to be associated with bears of smaller body size. So either female grizzly bears or black bears. And then once again, we saw that percent protein intake um, increased with body mass. And that was mostly because of bears feeding on these vertebrates. Um, the effect was not as evident in the summer. Uh, and that's a time when bears are not feeding on vertebrates as much as they are in the spring and in the fall. And then one last thing that really affects what bears are eating is competition from either other bears or other species. Um, bears, either black bears or grizzly bears, they are not a territorial species. They do not set up a territory that they defend from other conspecifics. They actually are very commonly have a whole lot of overlap in their own ranges. Um, some of that is with relatives. Some of that is with non-relatives. Um, so they typically are not kind of guarding an area for their food, but they will guard specific food resources. And it really depends on the quality in terms of how much energy they're going to put into defending a food. So if they're defending a carcass, which is a whole lot of calories, they're going to they're going to defend it pretty heavily. Whereas you you'll see that bears that are feeding on things like huckleberries, sometimes you can find a, a you know kind of a group of bears feeding in the same patch of food. They may keep their distance from each other but no, none of them are trying to run the other bears off of this patch of food because it's just not worth their energy. Um, there is also competition with those, those other species that I spoke about. Um, black bears um, are probably um, are kept from some of the highest quality food by grizzly bears. Um, and then, you know, sometimes wolves and cougars will um, be competitors with them, but sometimes they actually will take their food and so they're a help to them. So next set of questions, any? Yeah, we do have another one. Okay. Andy is asking, how much has the lake trout population and Yellowstone Lake affected the bears that depend on the cutthroat trout, trout population? Um, so I am gonna talk a little bit about um, changes in foods in just a minute. Um, that's kind of the next topic. Um, the cutthroat trout have declined quite a lot. They, they, I think they were at their lowest in the 2000s. Um, they are kind of on the upswing again, but it's, it's a very, very gradual increase that we're starting to see. Um, and when they were at their lowest, to my knowledge, we really did not see a lot of feeding. So bears were essentially having to go find some other food to eat. Um, as they started to come back a little bit, they're, st they're starting to see more bears um, focusing some attention on the spawning screens, streams, but it's probably not in the numbers that it used to be. Is there any other? No, that was the only one. Okay. So the next question is, do the bears get the energy they need? And this, that was a perfect question to come into this because um, this was a question 
that we undertook because of these changes in food resources. And this is an example of some of the changes in Yellowstone. This is a Yellowstone specific study that we did. Um, so the white bark pine is a, is a species that has been in decline because of um, blister rust and pine beetle kill. So there's been a, a lot of mortality in mature white bark pine trees in the Yellowstone ecosystem. And so that has decreased the amount of that food available for bears. Um, the elk populations have generally been on a, a, you know, a generally downward trend since their high point, you know, probably back in the 70s and 80s when their numbers were quite high actually. Um, the cutthroat trout is another one that um, we had a rapid decline and you can see it's starting to increase just ever so much. Um, on the other hand, bison are increasing in numbers. So there's, you know, there's some uh, that are, you know, doing better, but in a general sense, there has been a decline in the amount of food on the landscape. And so the question was, are these changing foods negatively affecting um, bear body condition. With that question, you can't really um, answer the question without also looking at the density of bears because we talked about how bears are competing with each other for food. Sometimes it's not about how much food there is, but their access to that food. So we uh, there has been a, a, a pretty significant change in the density of grizzly bear populations, especially in some areas um, since the since 2000. And so the question is, um, how does the density of grizzly bears and in that increased competition result, does that also result in diminished body condition? So we were looking at both of those factors. So what we do when we capture a bear if we, if possible, we take measurements of their body condition and we use this device where we're doing bioelectrical impedance. And that's where we can actually measure the percent body fat for that animal. Um, and then we also get a weight for their, for their, um, their body mass. And so if we can get percent body fat and then their total body mass, we can actually estimate what their lean body mass is. So the lean body mass, if you want to think about that, is just their structural body size. The thing that um, is basically their frame and uh, what they're built, what they're putting on fat every year. So that's increasing with their age. Um, and this is a graph that's showing that. So we were able to kind of uh, look at a, this is called a, oh, I can't, I can't remember the name, bon, Bonfernofli curve. I, I know I'm pronoun pronouncing that wrong, but um, this is a curve basically of the growth rate of, of male and female bears. Um, and you can see that it, it starts to level off for both sexes. For females, it levels off at roughly the age seven. And so uh, for this analysis, bears that, Females that were less than seven, we considered bear, those bears in their growing phase. If they were seven or older, then they were adult bears. For males, it's much different. They continue to grow in their body size and their lean body mass up until the time they're 14. And that's when it finally starts to level off. So bears that are less than 14, we're still calling them in their growing phase. And then above that, we're calling them adults. Uh, so we wanted to look at percent body fat and lean body mass. Um, body fat is something that they're just adding to that, that structural body size every year. When they come out of the den, they oftentimes will lose um, body fat for a little bit while, a little bit um, before the food really starts to come on. Um, but starting in about June, we typically will start to see a rise in body fat each month as time goes on. And so we modeled June, we bought, modeled body fat um, as it relates to the day of the year, starting in June all the way to November, um, to, uh, to the end of October. And, uh, and then we modeled that and we looked at whether or not there was a change in the body fat between the, de the, 
the decade of the 2000s and the decade of the 2010s. And as you can see, there's no difference. Those were, in, um, we did not detect any kind of a difference, which suggests to us that even though these foods have changed over that time, bears are still able, at least at this point, to get enough for them to reach you know, good body fat levels. And the dotted line is that 20% body fat that I mentioned earlier, which is what we believe is rough, a rough cutoff of what a female is going to need for litter production. And as you can see, on average, females are reaching that level well before they go into the den. So then if we look at lean body mass, what we found for, relative to lean body mass is that it decreased with increasing density of bears. So as, as the bears lived, for the bears that lived in the more high density areas compared to the lower density areas, um, they tended to have a smaller structural body size, probably because they are competing with more individuals for access to that food. We saw this for all of the males, irrespective of their whether they were growing phase males or adult males, and then we saw it for the growing females. The effect was not really evident for mature females. Um, and so uh, what this kind of means is that when bears are competing with each other for food, it looks like what they're doing is they're prioritizing fat putting on fat over increasing their lean body mass. And so if food is a little bit more limited because of access and competition from other individuals, you we're seeing a, um, a where younger bears are taking longer probably to, to reach that asymptotic body size. So they're taking longer to, to reach that size and they're probably, that probably accounts for why we believe that we're seeing a later age of first reproduction as population density increases. On the other hand, because they're prioritizing that fat, um, they are reaching fat levels that are sufficient for survival and reproduction, at least at this point. And then one other thing I want to talk about with respect to density and competition is, you know, we, we talked about range expansion. And obviously, we know that these populations are growing. Their, their density is increasing. And so when you think about it from the standpoint of a dispersing bear, when bears become independent of their mother, um, they may go uh, undergo dispersal and leave the place where they were born and go find a new place to live. Um, for males, this is almost a universal truth. Males almost always leave where they were born um, to go find a new place to live. And, and we believe that it probably mostly has to do with them um, as a way to avoid inbreeding. You don't want to breed with your relatives, so you go live somewhere else and your, and your female can stay close to where they were born. That's typically how it happens. Females will typically not disperse a very large distance, although it is sometimes seen. Um, so sometimes females will kind of gradually expand, whereas males will expand a little bit quicker. Um, this is a map of both the occupied range and the extent of occurrence for bears in, I'm kind of focused on Montana here, um, the occupied range is where we know bears live, you know, where they're setting up home ranges. This is, this is where we know bears exist all the time, essentially. Um, the extent of occurrence is where we see occasional observations of bears. We put these into um, watersheds. So these are watersheds. The, the blue area is areas where we, we have seen bears um, outside of the occupied range. And as you can see, most of Western Montana um, is starting to get filled in by at least this um, maybe present map. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of remind people that competition and dispersal um, are kind of driving this range expansion. So, any questions on that section? Nothing new here. Okay.
So um, the next part I wanted to talk about, given all of this information about now that we know how bears are kind of making decisions about getting food, why are some human foods really attractive to bears? So I wanted to go by, kind of do this by looking at some individual foods um, and garbage uh, is one of the main reasons that bears come into contact with humans and come into human populated areas. When garbage is available and not secure, um, against bears being able to access this. When you think about it, it's a really easy food for them to do. All they have to come in and just knock a garbage can over. The contents will spill out and oftentimes that food is pretty energy concentrated. It's like those white bark pine seeds that the little squirrels go get for them. We have just put all this food into this one nice little container. All they have to do is knock it over and they get a nice meal. If you think about how humans eat in the food that we might throw away, it's probably already a nice mixture of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Um, and in fact, it's probably really high in carbohydrates and fats. So it's probably really attractive to them. Um, bears can also access, a lot of times we're putting out our garbage at night to be collected the next morning. Um, or we have you know, dumpsters that are kind of available all the time. But bears can usually access garbage at night where they are able to get this really valuable food, but minimize their, their interactions with humans at the same time. This is kind of the same sort of idea that when you think about some of the other foods that bears are somewhat attracted to, animal feed, bird seed, beehives, um, we do have bears that are starting to really focus in on getting grain around grain silos that spill. Sometimes they'll, they'll break into those um, grain bags, those plastic um, you know, containers that they put grain into. Um, again, these are pretty easy foods for them to eat. They tend to be pretty energy concentrated. They're high in carbohydrates and fats. And again, they can usually try to access these without, with, at the same time that they're minimizing interactions with humans. Um, fruits and crops are a really um, major food that bears might uh, be tempted to come and feed on around humans. When you think about these, these are pretty much a semi-natural food. If you, you know, apples are one of the main ones. A lot of people have apples in their yards. Um, and bears will come in and feed on those. Apples may not be uh, you know, a native species to North America, but they're close enough to the types of foods that bears will eat that they don't really see a difference. Um, with corn, it's the same thing, not a native food, but um, definitely something they're gonna pay attention to. Um, these are very carbohydrate rich, they're very concentrated um, and um, their seasonal availability often coincides with the same time that bears are try trying to fatten up for winter. Um, and uh, sometimes th they have the added benefit that the trees or the plants, in, in the case of a cornfield, also provide the bears with cover so that they can feed on this food kind of in close proximity to humans, but still um, be somewhat hidden. And I finally want to talk a little bit about livestock. And so clearly, I've probably um, made it clear that meat is really valuable to bears. And it's a calorie-dense, high-quality food. Um, and so it's, it's kind of natural to think that they are going to take advantage of livestock when they can. Uh, the first way that they do it is scavenging boneyards or carcasses that are out there in the field. This is a really low effort, high gain kind of activity. So it's not surprising that bears are gonna do that, especially if, if bone yards are placed well away from where um, humans are. Um, but bears will also prey on livestock. We know that that happens. Um, predation expends more energy and it increases their risk of injury compared to feeding on um, bone yards. Um, 
So that probably explains why bears will prey on small livestock, such as chickens, more frequently than they will prey on large livestock like cattle. Um, and I can attest to this in the in the northern continental uh, northern continental divide ecosystem, for example, we basically just started over the last few years really trying to get um, a good tally on the number of um, conflicts that happen in the whole ecosystem. And I can tell you that the number of livestock conflicts is more than double, roughly, than the number of livestock conflicts. So they, they definitely are going to look for vulnerabilities and ease of kill. Um, so they're also going to look for young and injured animals. When they can. One of the good aspects that we can think about that probably keeps them from being a total pain in the butt when it comes to livestock is that livestock are not part of their natural food economies. If they're going to prey on livestock, it's something that they they are they're going to have to take the chance on trying it once. Once they try it and they maybe have learned to do it, that's when it becomes a real problem. But it's not part of the natural feeding economy. And so we do know many examples where bears live in an area where there's livestock and really do not pay all that much attention to them. One last thing that um, can really be a factor in terms of what makes um, human foods attractive to bears is this competition. So um, this becomes really important when you think about those subadult males that are in the midst of dispersing, they're trying to find a place to live, they might be getting kicked around by bigger bears. They sometimes will get you know, involved in a little bit riskier behavior than maybe some of their counterparts would. Um, because they're trying to avoid that competition. And they'll take chances on feeding on human-related foods more so than other bears might. We also see this with old individuals. And this, this bear here in this picture, um, we're pretty sure is bear number 211. Uh, that was, uh, this is a bear that was collared and uh, monitored multiple times in the Yellowstone ecosystem. He had a home range that was essentially in Yellowstone Park. Um, but as he got old, um, and these are not his teeth, this, these are teeth of another old bear. I think his number is 168. But as bears get old, they, their teeth get really, really worn down. They're much less capable of feeding on a lot of the foods that they used to. They're much less able to uh, compete with other bears, and they kind of get kicked out of where they might have normally fed. Um, and that's when they start uh, making more risky behaviors and risky decisions. And it's it's um, not an uncommon thing for us to find that we have a bear that was never in, in any conflict. And then as they're an old bear, they get into conflict. This old bear, 211, he lived in the park for the most part. Then he, in his old age, he kind of gravitated toward the town of Gardner and he got shot by someone in town. Any questions on that part? Um, I have a question. Uh, yes. Is there anyone else in the world studying grizzly bears, say in Russia or other countries where they exist, that's of the same nature as your research? And if so, are they finding similar things as far as their nutritional needs? Um, yeah, there's a there's quite a lot of studies. Um, grizzly bears uh, have grizzly bears and brown bears are the same species. So they have a very large worldwide, not worldwide, but um, circumpolar um, uh, distribution. So they live in Asia, they live in Europe, and they live in North America. Um, there's a lot of studies that are, are being done in, um, in, in Europe. There's bears that study, or people that study bears in Japan. Um, and I would say for the most part, this is pretty indicative of what's going on in other places as well. Um, and it ties into what I mentioned earlier that 
you know, you see a, you can see a really wide variation in the average body size among different populations. And that has to do with the food that is available to them and what they get used to eating. Um, and so I'm sure in some of these other areas of the world, um, there's probably foods that I have not even mentioned in this talk um, because they have a whole different food economy. Um, but I think that their basic biology and the things that we're describing are probably the same. Okay. So now I'm gonna bring it on home and talk about what we can do about bears and their attractiveness to some of the foods that we have available to them. Um, and I want to encourage people to um, think about this in terms of your own life. Take a, take a step back and whether you live in grizzly bear habitat or you live in a place that might eventually be grizzly bear habitat, take the time to think about your home, your community, your camp, if you go camping in grizzly bear habitat, um, and try to think about, try to put your yourself into the head of the bear. Like I just tried to tell you about the things that come into play that lead to their decisions about feed and see if you can se secure the attractants, identify the attractants that might wanna bring them into close contact with you and do what you can to secure those attractants. Um, and then I, I just encourage people to think about the mindset of making the wrong thing difficult and the right thing easy. And this is advice that we get from uh, a legendary horse trainer named Ray Hunt. And when you think about training, in a way we really are training bears. And right now, if we are living in an environment or a community where there are lots of foods available to bears that are unsecured, what are we doing but training them to come into human contact? Um, and slowly over time, this will erode their fear of us. This will erode their natural sense of wanting to avoid humans. They'll become habituated. They'll become food conditions. And that's when they become really um, far more um, dangerous to us and will usually be removed because of human safety concerns. And so let's think about instead um, training them in the good way where we are securing our attractants, we're keeping it away from them, and they're maintaining their natural avoidance of humans. They're not coming into contact with us. Um, and it makes for a much easier um, relationship between bears and humans. And we have lots of tools for doing this. And I'm gonna just let you watch a couple of videos about some of these tools. So this is a bear resistant container, obviously. So um, obviously uh, the bear did not get into that can. Um, I, I'll give you just a little bit of background on that. That That is a can that we were actually, this was at a trap site where we were trying to capture a bear for, for uh, research. It was not a conflict site, but it is on somebody's private land. They actually own a pretty significant chunk of land. Um, so this was well away from their house. But if you look at what how that bear behaved, there were a couple of times where he kind of lifted his head and looked around. There was that time where he ran away and came back. I think that's indicative of the way that bears naturally are gonna behave around people. They really wanna stay away from us. Um, and 
So I think it's instructive to remember that even a bear that large, that's a big guy, um, is really wanting to avoid us as much as possible. And then I will also say that uh, we were we were storing bait in that. Um, that's oftentimes what we do when we're out in the field is we'll we'll carry the bait in this bear resistant cans, and they are very effective. That bear did not get into those. Um, and besides that, there's a number of different bear resistant containers that we use for garbage and all kinds of other things. So there's definitely ways for us to secure foods or garbage or attractants inside bear resistant containers. We also can use electricity to our advantage, both in the form of electric fences and mats. This is a little bear that had gotten into this building. This was a building that is used as a um, chicken coop. And then, um, there was a, there's a mat there or a, a kind of a over the door. There was a um, electric fencing put up over the door and you can see that it, it kept the bear from getting in there again. We can also use, use electric fencing in a lot of different um, uses. You'll see the one up uh, above where we put it around a um, grain bin. And then um, also used it in a in a kind of a community uh, um, garbage collection site. This is another example of a of an electric mat. This is a, a place where someone unfortunately had a freezer. Oh. Um, the freezer was kept in a not enclosed building. So there, there, this was outside. It was not, you know, there was no door to be able to close off this freezer. The bear had origin, had previously gotten into the freezer. And so this mat was put out to try to teach it not to get into that. We don't recommend that you keep a refrigerator or a freezer outside where a bear has access to it. But I did want to use that as an example of the effectiveness of electric fences and mats. This is another um, example of a tool that we can use. Um, this is a scare device. So that's a motion sensitive device where a bear comes uh, close enough to it, it's gonna make that sound. In this particular case, I believe it was it was deployed because a bear was essentially coming in and feeding on someone's apples in their yard. So it's not like it was getting garbage, but they were just trying to keep the bear away um, from that res respect. There's a number of tools that we have access to that can really help um, keeping bears away from human food. Um, for example, fruit cleaning programs are, are things that are becoming more and more common in communities all around um, the lower 48 where people get together, they help um, their neighbors collect the fruit off of their trees, and then sometimes they'll, they'll uh, add an event where they get a, a fruit press out and they everyone brings their apples and they spend the whole day pressing the fruit and people can take home cider. Um, some people are using this um, as a way to uh, make spirits, either um, hard cider or even um, like brandy. There's a, there's a little company that started up in Troy, Montana, where they are, it's a pink bench distillery where they really are embracing this and they're getting apples and making spirits out of it. Um, that's another example. So you you can kind of make this a community event um, at the same time that you're trying to bear bear proof your community. Guard animals have been used very effectively to both um, protect homes and crops and livestock. Carcass removal programs are really helpful for getting that food off the landscape so bears don't have access to it and don't want to come in for further investigation of a, of a livestock herd. And there's more and more of these. And with respect to this, if people are interested in 
working in their community to try to make it a little bit more bear smart. Um, I would invite them to go to the to the website that I've put here on this um, this slide to the IGBC, that's the Interagency Grizzly Bear Committee. That is the group that oversees um, uh, recovery of the lower 48 grizzly bear populations. And they have uh, a bunch of the agencies have worked together to put together this manual for how to go about making your community bear smart. It involves first doing an assessment, looking, looking around your community, trying to find what the attractants are. Then it's making a plan that can take, you know, you can, you can plan for a many years process, but over time you're trying to reduce as many of those attractants or secure as many of those attractants as possible. So I really welcome people to go look at that. Um, and with that, I am going to finish. I will, I wanted to put this slide in because I wanted to thank all of our member agencies that help with bear management and bear research in the lower 48, especially here in Montana. Um, and then I wanted to put some uh, links to places where you could go for more information. There's the Montana uh, Fish, Wildlife and Parks website. There's the Interagency Grizzly Bear Study Team website, and then the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service website. And then below is the full citations for all of the different studies that I talked about in this talk. And I'll leave this up so people can take a picture or copy things down if they want to. So, thank you, Cecily, and I uh, really appreciate your time tonight and being here. And uh, we did have one more question in the chat, and it's from Andy. Uh, he was asking about scat. <laughs> in the size of, is the size of the scat indicative of the size of the bear? Say if I find a very large pile of scat full of berry seeds, is it a small bear since, if I remember correctly, uh, you said they tend to eat more of a diet of berries than large bears. Is it not use, or is it a not, not a useful indicator? I would say for the most part, the size of the scat can be a useful indicator. So, um, if you see a very large scat, it probably came from a very large bear. Um, if you see a smaller one, it it's a little bit more variable. Um, so, you know, as much as I talk about how bears might prefer certain foods, every bear is individual that is capable of eating all of these foods. So it's it's you can't really assume that if it's a fruit scat that it came from a smaller bear. But if the, if the scat is really big, it probably came from a big bear. Thank you. And we're, we're getting thank yous in the comments as well. Um, Carol's this great presentation. Thank you. Um, I had another question of just came up when we we're talking about the different foods. Um, within those economies you were talking about, do you see bears that per se are in a certain lineage that learn about certain foods, but not maybe the neighbor bear that had different mothers and have different things. Like, is that something you see? Um, so I, I would say in general that um, bears definitely learn from their mother. So that's, that's gonna be their first lesson in how to eat is the one that they get from their mother. But the other thing to think about with bears is that they are very inquisitive. They are, um, you know, they're going to seek out new foods. And so it's it's not, you're, I don't think it's probably wise to think that just because, you know, you were raised by your mom, you're gonna be just like she was. You're gonna find other foods in your life as well. Yeah, makes sense, thank you. Uh, does anyone else have more questions for Cecily? If people have more questions, would you want to get a hold of that they can get a hold of you or they can reach out to us on yeah. social media or through our communications? Yeah, that was work. Great. Yeah, you can try it. Yeah. Add to it. Well, some I know some folks already have contact with us, so they can they can reach out to us. Again, you guys can reach out on social media as well to our, our folks who are all in the same division, so they can they can connect you with the right person. Yeah. All right. Thanks. I'll stop the recording. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.